so glad that you're here. Let's put our hand over our heart and make our declarations. And everybody say this with me. I am who God says I am, a child of God, the righteousness of God. I am the apple of God's eye. I am God's workmanship created for good works. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Today, I open up my mind to receive the word of God so I can think like God, be like God, and do life the way God intended for me to live. Let's lift up holy hands and say it with me. Come, Holy Spirit, help me elevate my thinking so I can elevate my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, are y'all ready for the word? Would you just give somebody a hug or a high five and tell them you're glad they're here today? So honored that you're here. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube or another social media means, we just want to say welcome you. We love you and welcome to Elevate Life Church, everybody. It's great to be with you. We launch a new series today called The Rhythm of Life. And you know, life is about rhythm. Sometimes we don't understand that. But I just wanted to start by reading uh, what an author, Daniel Nielsen, said about rhythm. He said, when your body, your soul, and your spirit are in alignment, wholeness is the result. It's how you were created to live as your true self. It's where your other it's where your outer being is dancing to the same rhythm as your inner being. It's where your ego self no longer controls your life and you're at one with the divine source, God. And at that place of stability is also where the highest form of love exists, where healing for the body takes place, where the heart and the mind are in a harmonious state of emotional balance. Today, it can be scientifically proven that whatever emotions you may be experiencing, whether they be pleasurable or painful, specific chemical proteins called neuropeptides are released into your body. And simultaneously, a corresponding frequency is produced that influences the neural pathways in your brain. In a nutshell, your emotions can be working for you or against you and your physical body will react accordingly. It is a fact that the human body will become weaker and open to sickness when it experiences negative or fear-based emotions over a prolonged period of time. These lower frequency emotions are debilitating and they're expressed as fear, shame, guilt, anxiety, anger, bitterness, hate, unhealthy cravings, and dissatisfaction. But the body will function at its optimum when it experienced love-based emotions. So we put an amen on that. Which is where the divine is allowed to flow through you. These higher frequency emotions are empowering and they're expressed as love, joy, gratitude, and forgiveness. Let's just stop right there for a minute. How many of y'all know it's better to love than hate? Come on. It's better to be joyful than sorrowful, yet sorrowful things will happen in our life. It's better to be grateful than ungrateful, and forgiveness is always better than unforgiveness. You see, these are love-based emotions. They're empowering, and they start with love, joy, gratitude, forgiveness, trust, compassion, acceptance, happiness, and inner peace. Nielsen goes on to say, every cell within your body is calling you to join the dance and be aligned with love. Come on, how many of y'all want to be aligned with love today? So your rhythm of life is your way of life. A lot of people don't understand this. You have a rhythm. In fact, the number one killer in the United States of America is heart disease. And it's primary fu primarily fueled not by your genetic makeup or because you have some type of history of heart problems in your family, but it's usually because of arrhythmia. In other words, your heart gets off of rhythm. So minor heart disease that turns into major heart disease always starts with the heart getting out of rhythm, not just your arteries being clogged or something like that. And a lot of people, they, they just think, well, this happens. You know, you get older and it happens. No, you live long enough that oftentimes there are prolonged emotions that are debilitating you that you don't even know. Fear, shame, guilt, anxiety, anger, bitterness, hate, unhealthy cravings, dissatisfaction. And pretty soon your heart watch this now, 
begins to get out of rhythm because it's beating to a different type of rhythm than God intended. Rather than love, there's hate. Rather than joy, there's sorrow. Rather than forgiveness and mercy and grace, there's shame and guilt and anxiety. Rather than being free from strife, you feel anger and you, you deal and you go with your unhealthy cravings and you live a dissatisfied life. Henry David Thoreau said this, most men live quiet lives of desperation. So finally, your heart starts beating to a different rhythm. Why? Because it's beating to the rhythm of your emotions. And so many people don't realize that, that you can control your rhythm. You can control your life. When you create a better rhythm, you create a better life. So what is rhythm? I've studied this now for over a decade, over 10 years, and I'm just starting both in my masterminds with CEOs and small business owners and leaders to teach this. But I wanted to unveil it to you as the church because I felt like over my sabbatical that God wanted me to talk about rhythm. Rhythm comes from a Greek word, rhythmos. It means flow. There is either a Honestly, if I can say it this way, and I don't mean it to sound harsh at all, but there is either a divine flow in your life or there's a demonic flow in your life. There's either a positive flow in your life or there's a negative flow in your life. And the enemy of your soul, the devil himself, wants you to get on the side of demonic flow. Doesn't mean you're demonically possessed. It just means that through your anger, through your resentment, through your unforgiveness, through your hatefulness, through your meanfulness, through your vindictiveness, through your, your, your trying to, um, to deal with your own problems rather than just totally turning it over to God, then your heart begins to readjust itself and it gets out of rhythm and your life is out of rhythm because you were never meant to hate. You were meant to love. You were never meant to be negative. You were meant to be positive. You were never meant to be on the wrong side of God. God wants you to be on the right side of God and he wants to, you to get into rhythm with him. Too often times we don't even realize this, but we're out of rhythm, not only with God, but we're out of rhythm with ourselves and out of rhythm with other people. It's a real thing. Rhythm is a real thing. You see, rhythm is the choreography of your life to the beat of your heart. It is a divine understanding that God has a plan and that you're a part of it. He has a purpose for why you were born. And your rhythm is to live knowing that your life has meaning and purpose. Some of you remember a few months ago, I talked about the book Blue Zones. And I was just so intrigued by that. You know, I'm fighting age, even though I've given in to some of it. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm fighting age. And, um, and I've, I've embraced the fatherhood. I've embraced the gray, you know. But, but the reality is I'm intrigued by those seven different places in the world where scientifically for over 25 years there's been a study that's, being, that's been done and is ongoing about people who are living 100 plus. They're centenarians. They're people that are living 100 plus and they're 100 plus healthy. Places like Okinawa, Japan, and we talked about this a few months ago, but, but one of the most fascinating things is that, that right here in the United States of America, Loma Linda, that there's a group of people called Seventh-day Adventists, and they've, they've found out that these people, because of their lifestyle, that they're living longer than all other Americans, and they're all in this one little place in Loma Linda, and, and I, I was so delighted that weekend to meet Seventh-day Adventists who are actually in our church, and they said, we found our tribe, we found our people, and... It was just so amazing, but, but the thing that trumps, watch this now, lifestyle, the thing that trumps uh, diet, the thing that trumps good genetics, watch this, is one common denominator is that people that live to be 100 plus and they're healthy have meaning and purpose. You see, the enemy of your soul does not want you to have meaning and purpose in your life. He just wants you to be mean on purpose. Y'all getting what I'm saying? In other words, the devil's goal is to get you mean. The devil's goal is to get you on purpose mean because people have hurt you. The devil's goal is to get you on the side of life that gets you out of rhythm with God, that gets you out of rhythm with yourself, and you can't figure out that when you do that, your body eventually will manifest that arrhythmia and your heart will be diseased. You see, rhythm is the synchronicity of your spirit, soul, and body. Let me ask you a question. How many of you know you're more than body, you're more than soul, but we are spirit, soul, and body? Yes, we are. Rhythm is discovering who you are, and it's developing the best version of yourself as possible. 
It's knowing what you want and then aligning the best version of you with your highest and best use. We've talked about this recently as well. But here's what I want to tell you. I believe this with all my heart that most people in life get more of what they don't want rather than what they want because they never decide what it is they want. Now, that's one thing you could say, well, I know, no, I know what I want. But you see, then there's this other little thing. There's something that, becomes, that, that's, that comes before what you want in life. And, and in fact, sometimes it messes up what you want. And you begin to, again, have unhealthy cravings and desire the wrong things. And that is what we've come to know as core values. That's a what matters most. It's the things that matter most to you. And many of you know the story. It's in my book, Your Divine Fingerprint. I take a whole chapter and talk about that you have a fingerprint that nobody else has to leave, an imprint that nobody else can leave, and that part of your divine fingerprint is to discover what it is that matters most to you. I can't tell you what matters most to you, but I can tell you what matters most to me. And I remember when Sheila and I sat down, and by the way, today, uh, Sheila, you know, honestly, I sent you that email this morning and just thanked you and honored you for, it's, it's, it's our anniversary day, it's the 20th, and for us, that's every month, and so I thought it was 488 months, I got confused, not about the date, but I, I just, you know, math, it's my, not my thing, but it's actually 499 months, next month we celebrate 500 months together, 500 months, that's a long time, y'all. But some of you know the story that I sat down with when we were 15 and 16 years of age and I drew a triangle. I said, this is you, this is God, this, or this is me, this is God. And, and, and as long as we'll be our best for God, we'll meet at the top. And listen, let's, you know, this is the way I see relationship work. And the Bible says, don't let the sun get on your anger and give your enemy a foothold. In other words, that's what happens with so many people. They stay angry. They don't just let the sun set on their anger. They, they set on their anger. And they keep setting on it. And the Bible says, don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but delight yourself in the Lord. Be like a tree that's planted by rivers of living water. But the ungodly are not so. Why? Because they sit in their stuff. They sit. And so, so I said, listen, let's, we're 15, 16 years old, 1976. I'm, I'm saying, let's, let's don't go to bed angry. Let's, if we're going to date, let's, let's don't walk away and practice divorce. Let's, let's work out our conflict. Are you, are you with me on that? She goes, yeah. And so we, we started that journey together. And then about in our twenties, I can remember making a list of the things that I valued most. It was my most matters list. And I encourage every marriage couple, if you don't know how to do that, then then again, I encourage you to, to get in my book because I, I, I go through a chapter where I talk about how to establish core values and I put lists there and you can add to your own list and find out what matters most to you and what matters most to the person that matters most to you. And in our early 20s or actually mid 20s, we, we decided that and we did that together. Now, why am I mentioning that? Because synchronicity or rhythm in your life starts with you knowing what matters most to you so you can live a life that most matters. And out of that knowing what matters most to me, then comes what I want in life based on what matters most to me. And again, we're talking about rhythm. We're talking about how life works and how marriage works and how business works and how kingdom works. And so then after you know what matters most and then you know what it is that you want, then you begin to align your attitudes, your behaviors, and your beliefs based on what matters most to you and what you want in life. Again, why do most people get more in life of what they don't want rather than what they want? Because it's not just because they haven't decided what they want, but watch this, they're unclear about what matters most to them. And so I'm gonna date myself here as if I don't do that always. But back in the 60s, Doris Day sang a song, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see, que sera, sera. Can I tell you, the future is ours to see. And I get into rhythm, watch this now, with myself and with other people. And I want to just focus on that for just a minute because there's a rhythm. You know, when two people dance, there's a rhythm. When two people have sex, there's a rhythm. And everybody said, anyway, so in other words, there's a rhythm that takes place between two individuals, but it transcends the body. It transcends that motion but it's spirit, soul, and body. And that's when I meet somebody that wants the same thing that, I, or that, that what matters most to them matters most to me, matters most to us. It kicks something in in scripture that if any two of you agree on earth as touching anything on earth, my father in heaven will do it. So that's what a family of God is all about. That's what a tribe is all about. You see, when you discover your tribe, you begin to understand, hey, these, I'm around people that they, it, the, the same things that matter to me matter to them. And and then all of a sudden you, you get on the same page with your wants and it happens in your marriage and it happens in your relationships with your friends and, and then it happens with God. Watch this. What does God say about what you want? 
He says, delight yourself in me and I'll give you the desires of your heart. What are you doing? You're getting into rhythm with God. God, I, I, I worship you. God, I want what you want for my life. God, I put you first. And he says, you know what? You just got into rhythm with me and I'm gonna give you the desires of your heart. You see, nobody can tell you what you want, but you can tell you what you want based on what's most important to you. And then you align your behaviors, your beliefs, and your attitudes towards that. And there is a rhythm that begins to take place in your life, spirit, soul, and body. And you begin to attract other people who flow in that same divine rhythm. And it's called the kingdom of God. And it's called, if any two of you agree is touching anything on earth, my Father in heaven will do it. And by the way, one puts a thousand to flight and two put 10,000 to flight. Why? Because now there's a divine rhythm. You're not just tapped into other people, but you're tapped into the rhythm of God. Come on, put an amen on that. I hope that speaks to you. <clears throat> Rhythm is the confluence of all your relationships, past, present, and future, and you choose to use your influence and how you will be influenced by those relationships. What is rhythm? It is the divine awareness of who you are that you have a heartbeat that is meant to beat in tune with others. The first sound you ever heard was the beat of your mother's heart. The last heartbeat you'll ever hear is your own. You find your rhythm when your heart beats for what God's heart beats for. Can I just ask you a question? How many of you would say, you know what? I want that kind of heart. I want the kind of heart that my heart beats, come on, for what God's heart beats for. I want to be moved with compassion like Jesus was. You know that before Jesus ever did any miracles, you can read it all through scripture, he was moved with love. He was moved with compassion. He, was, he got into the rhythm of God. He was moved by God towards people that needed miracles, towards people that needed food, towards people that needed clothing, towards people that were in great need. And, and because his heart beat for what God's heart beat for, he says, I do nothing on my own. I only do that which my Father gives me the authority to do. God wants us to be those kinds of sons and those kinds of daughters. You know, it's an amazing thing that when you fall in love, when you fall in love with somebody, what happens is there is a rhythm unbeknownst to you that begins to happen between your heart and that person's heart. And all of a sudden, these neuropeptides and these neuropathways begin to be forged because chemicals, norepinephrine, epinephrine, nitric oxide, serotonin, dopamine, all these love, what's called the love chemicals, begin to be released in your mind. Why? Because your heart, this, this person, your heart begins to beat the same beat with that person. And all you know to say and to describe it is, I fell in love because something takes over. There's a rhythm that happens. What is rhythm? Your rhythm, you find your rhythm when you align your heartbeat with what you value, like we just said, with, with other who's, whose hearts beat for the same thing that you value. Welcome to the family of God. Put an amen on that. Rhythm happens when your think, be, do, align to produce your have that ultimately you want to have. You begin to think it. You begin to be it. You begin to do it. You begin to have it. It's rhythm. Rhythm of life happens when you choose to live your life by design rather than by default. It's so easy for us to go through life, and even in marriage, just to by default. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, you know, you're with me, and it's, it's just more by default than by design. It's so easy, you get a job, and you, you first love that job, but then it's just by default, you know, you just show up. And then sometimes our emotions and that kind of thing, in between us and other people, are more by default than by design. We just give in to what our natural inclination is, not our supernatural designation. Rhythm of life happens when you trust in the Lord with all your heart and you don't lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways, everybody say all your ways, you acknowledge him and he will direct your path. It's knowing and believing that at the end of the day, at the end of the season, at the end of the relationship, at the end of the job, or any transition that takes place in our lives, that he is working all things together for our good and that is the will of God that our rhythm of life produce health, balance, and growth. And can I just tell you, as the father of this house, as the dad in this place, that you know what my desire for you is, and you know what God's, as our Heavenly Father, His desire for us is, is for us to understand that no matter what happens, no matter what happens in your life, here's what Scripture says, here's what God wants us to know. Keith Craft, put your name in there. 
All things work together for your good. Good things, bad things, even some of your bad choices, even good. I will work all things together for your good because you love me and you're called according to my purpose. Can I just prophesy over you? You may be going through a tough time. I declare and I speak over you that all things, it doesn't matter, past, present, and future, are going to work together for your good. Somebody put a rhythmic amen on that. We're in sync with God when we believe that. We're talking about finding your rhythm in God. So if we're gonna find rhythm in God, we gotta know a little bit about God. I could talk a lot about God. I just wanna give you three things today. Take a look at your notes. Number one, God is hate. (sighs) Just makes me feel good to be a part of the family of God because God is hate and every time I feel hate, I know me and God are one. No, 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 no. Would you say it with me? God is love. Wow. If I'm gonna be in rhythm with God, I gotta leave the hate, y'all. God is love. So if God is love, you know, I grew up in church in the 1960s. Um, I can remember being in church and man, you know, I, I loved all the old hymns. I still love all the old hymns. But I can remember the day when we walked in church and all of a sudden there was this this machine that shot a light up on a white wall. And there was a transparency there that someone drew the words on and it took us from the hymnal to the wall. How many of y'all, old church folk, 19, come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, we'd all been singing from hymns and all of a sudden we walked into church and there was somebody, a servant leader running the transparency machine. It's like, what, what? Some of y'all are too, you, you don't even know the good old days. All this stuff costs millions of dollars, man, I'm going back. Let's spend $25 for a transparency machine and put it up on the wall, forget all this stuff. But man, I remember, and, and you know what one of the songs was? One of the first songs I can remember in the 60s? It's out of 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love knows not God, for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Can I just tell you, it wasn't just a little song. It was the first time we started singing a scripture song, y'all. Scripture song. God is love. Look what the Bible says, 1 John 4, 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. Put an amen on that. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God for God is love in this. So God says, now here's how to love. The love of God was manifested towards us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. You know what the temptation is? Is to not live through him, but to live through the hurt. To live through the lens of the pain. To live through the lens of what's unfair. To live through the lens of judgmentalism. To live through the lens that Jesus actually died and gave his life for our natural default is to do it our way. And yet the Bible says that, let's remember God sent his only begotten son of the world that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins or payment, a substitute for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, this is the word of God, we also ought to love each other. God is love, everybody. God is love, and when you feel hate, even if you're justified in your hate, when you feel so disappointed, when you feel so broken, when you feel so hurt, the enemy of your soul at that point wants to move in. Why? Because his goal is to get you out of rhythm with God, to get you out of rhythm with yourself, and to get you out of rhythm with the people of God. You see, the Bible says God is love, but then it goes on to say this. Another immutable fact about God is God so loves us. 
God doesn't just love you. You know, a few years ago, I got this revelation. Some of y'all remember, I said, when you tell somebody you love them, don't go, hey man, love you, man. You know, we grew up, Sheila and I, we went to, we went to you know, a Christian college. I hey, love you, man, love you. I go, they don't love me. <laughs> Buddy, you remember, love you, man. Hey, love you. Thank you, thank you. You got some money? I need some help right now. Hey, love you, man. Hey, love you. You remember all that? It went around like in the 80s. Hey, love you, love you, love you, love you. Yeah, love you, love you. Aren't you glad the scripture didn't say, God says, love you. You know what it says? For God, come on, y'all, so love. Some of y'all remember when I started teaching on this a few years ago, I said, just, just say it in a, in, a, in a very white voice if you can. <clears throat> I can't. God so loves you. And when you tell somebody you love them, don't just say, hey, love you. Go, I so love you. Some of y'all got that voice. I want it when I get to heaven. But listen, here's an immutable fact about God. It'll never change. God is love. Watch this now. And God so loves you. John 3, 16, you know it. Come on, say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Put your name in there for Keith. Come on, say your name for that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is a good God. God is a good father. Here's the, here's the next and last thing I want to tell you about God is that God wants us to know, grow, sow, and go love. You know, our word this year, prophetic word from God is that we're gonna grow. That means there's some pruning that's required. That means that God has to cut some stuff back so other things can grow. But here's the reality. There's never growth without some kind of pruning. But here's the bottom line. God wants us to know love. God wants us to grow love. God wants us to sow love. And God wants us to go love. Just go love people. Just go love people. I love what Nelson Mandela said. I was in South Africa this last year. I'll be there next year for a men's conference in March. And I love that country. And there, there's a place that we always stay that is a giant Nelson Mandela statue. And he said this. He said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than the opposite. Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy to a friend. And I wanna make this statement right here on this stage. And again, as the dad of this house, as the father of this house, as the founder of this church, here's what I wanna tell you. I wanna, I wanna tell you with no uncertain terms that we denounce at Elevate Life Church, we denounce white supremacy, we denounce racism of any kind, we denounce hatred in all forms, we denounce nationalism that's attached to that. And I want you to know if you are here, we love you. If you're not here, we love you. And I wanna make this statement, and I shouldn't have to make this statement, but I wanna make this statement. We denounce it, we detest it. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we live in a world right now that's filled with hate. Filled with hate. And where is the world gonna see love if they don't see it in us? Come on, if they don't see it in us, if they don't see it in us, then they're not gonna see it, ladies and gentlemen. What happened in Charlottesville, Virginia is a disgrace. It's a disgrace to God, it's a disgrace to the kingdom, it's a disgrace to the church, it's a disgrace to America that there's still that spirit. And what is the spirit? Is it a white, black thing? No, let me tell you what, it's a hate thing. I said it's a hate thing. And I want you to understand something. In this church, we don't just stand against haters. We stand for love because God is love and we love the haters and we love everybody. That's what I want you to understand. We love everybody because God loves everybody. And every person, regardless of the color of their skin or their ethnicity or where they live in the world, there's so much hate right now in the world. There's so much hate politically. There's so much hate racially. There's so much, it's all hate driven. There's so much hate. North Korea, uh, you know, threatening to 
nuclear bomb the whole world. There's just, there's such a spirit of hate. And in the name of Jesus, we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if God loves us, if God is love, then we ought to love each other people. Let's get the love rhythm going. Let's understand that God wants us to love. A few years ago, I was so moved with the story that came out of Charleston, South Carolina. Some of y'all will remember. And I just, I just couldn't believe that a young man could be so mature. I couldn't believe that a 17-year-old a whose mother had been murdered by a young white guy named Dylan who walked into a church and just started killing people. The spirit of hate that led him. I was so moved by that. Now, you know, to this day, he doesn't know me yet, but we're gonna know, he's gonna know me and someday he's gonna be on this platform and if you're in our church, you'll remember, you will remember that I told you. You know why? Because God's hand is on this young man because of what was in his heart. And in case you missed it or even if you saw it, I just wanted to remind you of what moved me and what moves the heart of God when horrible, tragic Things that are driven by hate happen. Somebody has to step up and somebody has to say what Chris Singleton said that day that his mother was killed by hate. I want to take you back to Charleston, South Carolina. Watch this. On June 17th, a gunman opened fire at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Nine people lost their lives, including a mother of three who was also a part-time minister. We're going to talk to her son, Chris, in a moment. But first, a look at his life since that fateful evening. It was a tragic night in Charleston, South Carolina. Breaking overnight, church massacre. Nine people killed when a man walks into a prayer meeting and starts shooting. One of the worst mass killings in South Carolina history. Charleston is a city in mourning. Nine among the victims, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, a single mother of three. Her son Chris, a student at Charleston Southern University, remembers getting the call that night. When I got the phone call, I knew something was wrong because someone called me off of her phone and it wasn't her. I was just praying that it wasn't severe, but when I got down there, I realized that it was something major. When Chris found out she passed away, his focus turned to his family. I really felt bad for my brother and sister because they haven't had the time that I spent with her. So I felt worse for them than I did for myself. Speaking at a vigil for the victims, Chris preached a message of forgiveness for the gunman. I just say love is always stronger than hate. So if we just love the way my mom would, then the hate won't be anywhere close to what love is. I felt like there's only two things I could do in that situation. I could be hateful and not forgive him, or I could forgive him, and I just chose just to love him and just to forgive him. You see, here's what the Bible says. Listen. Paul said to the church of Ephesus, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Can I tell you, you're, if you're a part of Elevate Life Church, you're a family of choice and you're, you're much bigger than just this church family. We're a part of a heavenly family. We're a part of the family of God that we've been graced to be his family in the earth. That he would grant you according to his riches and glory. And I just speak this over your life, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love, not rooted and grounded in hate, not rooted and grounded in your pain, not rooted and grounded, but that you be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height. And look at this, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Come on, put an amen on that. God wants us to know his love, to be rooted and grounded in his love, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Would you just raise up your hands all across this place. Pray this to me. Say, God, help me to be rooted and grounded in love and to know the love of Christ. 
to be filled with the fullness of God. God, fill us with your fullness, not fill us with anger, fill us with upsetness, fill us with hurt, but whatever we're, we're full of, we'll be led by. And in the name of Jesus, this family of choice, Elevate Life Church, will be led by love in the name of Jesus. Now look, this is the scripture. If you're a church person, you know this verse. Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think. We love to quote that, but that verse does not work without all the other verses. That you're rooted and grounded in love, that you know the love of Christ. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could ask or think, that's God but God does it according to what? Come on, read it if you can see it. The power that works in us. What is that power? What is that power? What is that power? Luther Vandross called it the power of love. Power of love. Huey Lewis. Power of love. It's the power of love. Come on, y'all. That God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think according to the power, power, power of love that works in us. The power of love. Some of y'all have no idea. You see, here's the truth. God wants you to understand something. And I want to leave you with this today. And then we're going to go out of here worshiping in just a few minutes. If we're going to find our rhythm in God, we got to find the love rhythm. It's in your notes. We've got to embrace God's most important command, and that is love. Isn't it amazing? Let me just give you the scripture. Matthew 22. Let's go there real quick on the big Bible in the sky. That... There was a lawyer that came to Jesus and he asked him a question. He was testing him. And here's what he said. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus could have said, well, listen, you know, it's important. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt make no other gods before me. You'd think that'd be the one most important to God. Thou shalt make no other gods before me. Hey, you know, there's a lot of other commandments that go with it. But here's what God said. Jesus said, you shall love. Everybody say love the Lord your God with all your heart. Not a little bit, don't half step. But you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, but he doesn't stop there. He, now the Lord just said, what's the greatest commandment? He said, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you get these two right, just these two, you won't have to worry about murder. You see, murder is not just when you stab somebody, when you shoot somebody. It's when you speak against a child, a son, or a daughter of God. That's murder. The truth is the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's what the Bible says in John 10, 10. But Jesus came that we might have a life, come on, and life more abundantly. How do you have life more abundantly? You live in the rhythm of love. He said, if you just get these two right, you don't have to worry about the others. There's another story when another lawyer came to Jesus. It's found in Luke, the 10th chapter. And listen to this. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and he tested him. He said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the first attorney, the first lawyer asked this. He said, he said, what's the greatest? What's the most important? We just talked about that. Core value. What's, what's, God, what's your number one core value? What matters most to you more than anything else? He said, if you're going to live a life that most matters, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Everybody goes, oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I just hate them. <laughs> I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Oh, yeah. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. That means to be Christ-like. Yeah, but I have unforgiveness in my heart towards you. Yeah, you've wronged me. Yeah, you've, I have a reason to hate. I have a reason to march. I have a reason to take a gun and shoot people. I have a reason this last month, almost to the day on the anniversary of his mother's death, Chris Singleton. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think, according to the power that works in you, almost to the date that his mother was murdered down by hate, he signed a contract with the Chicago Cubs. Almost to the date. Oh, you can hate if you want to. 
You can be mad about what's unfair that's happened in your life if you want to. You can march about it. You can protest about it. You can write about it. You can be mean about it. You can do whatever about it. Or you just say, you know what? Love is stronger than hate. And I choose as a son and daughter of the Most High God to, to love. And God says, man, you just made your dreams and my dream come true for you. Watch what I do in your future, even almost on the same date that you decided. I had two decisions to make, young Chris Singleton said. I could not forgive, and I could forgive. My mother, my mother would want me to forgive. This is what makes great families so important. This is why your decisions about love don't just affect you, but they affect your children and how the world goes for your tribe and for the tribe of God. You see how you respond to your hurt, your pain, your wrongs, your whatever. Here was this young 17-year-old kid that was now the parent to a young brother and his sister. I had two choices. Love is stronger than hate. Elevate Life Church, to our Elevate Life Church family that's watching on the web, love is stronger than hate. Love is stronger. So the attorney said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus didn't say, repent of your sins. Ask God to forgive you because you've been bad. Here's what he said. He says, what's written in the law? What's your reading of it? In other words, what's your understanding? See, this is our problem. It's what we understand. The lawyer said, well, well, I know what the law says. The law says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you've answered right. Do this and you'll live. Can I tell you, there's a lot of people that are alive, but they're not living. When you're living in anger, when you're living in hate, when you're living trying to build a case against somebody when you're living as a racist racist person listen we 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 are not just against uh, people that are racist we are for gracist we are gracist so he says oh you're racist oh no i'm gracist i'm under the grace of god man i've got the power of god to do things god's way i, I i'm a gracist not a racist how can you hate when god is love how can you hate when God so loved you. How can you not forgive when you've been forgiven for much? He said, go do this and you'll live. But the lawyer didn't stop. He said, well, let me ask you one more question, Jesus. <laughs> Who is my neighbor? And what's come to be known as Socratic method, Jesus answered his question with a story. Jesus said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves and they stripped him of his clothing and they wounded him and departed and they left him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down the road and when he saw this man that had been bruised, when he saw this man that had been beaten, when he saw this man that had been stolen from, when he saw this man that had been robbed from and left for dead, the priest went on the other side of the road and walked by him. He passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at a place, he came and he looked and he saw the man, he passed on the other side. In answer to the lawyer's question, who's my neighbor, Jesus went on to tell this story, but there was this Samaritan and he journeyed and he came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. Everybody say love. So he went to him and he bandaged his wounds and he poured on the oil and the wine and he set him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And on the next day he departed and he took out two denarii and he gave them to the tin keeper and he said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Not because this guy's my best friend, not because he's a part of my tribe, not just because he goes to my church. By the way, he's a Samaritan. So Jesus looks at the lawyer and he says, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among thieves? And he said, not the Samaritan, because he couldn't even get it out of his mouth. He said, the one who showed mercy. He said, then you go and you do likewise. Oh, let me just tell you something. 
What does the priest represent in the story? The religious person. I love God, but I don't like you. So I'm gonna go on the other side of the street. I, yeah, I love God, I'm a Christian, I'm Christ-like, but I don't feel like being Christ-like right now because you hurt me. I don't feel like being Christ-like right now because of your people. I don't feel like being Christ-like right now because of the atrocities. I don't feel like being Christ-like right now because you've abused me. I don't feel like being christ So I'm going to, uh, uh, on the other side of the street. That's what the priest represented, a religious spirit. The Levite represented the law. Judge and you shall be judged. I'm going to go on the other side of the street because you know what? I don't have to deal with that person. It's not, he's not my problem. I'm not my brother's keeper. And he went on the other side. Then there was a man who was a Samaritan. He stopped. He was moved with compassion. Did you know that before Jesus ever did a miracle, the Bible says he was moved with compassion? What moves you? You know what moves most people? They're hurt. Mothers Against Drunk Driving was started because somebody's relative was killed in a drunk driving accident. You see, we get passionate about the things that hurt us, and so we take up causes. And Jesus said, listen, why don't you just love? Come on, why don't you just love? Why, why do you have to have something bad happen to stir you up to try to make something else bad happen? Let love, the Bible says, be your greatest aim. Let me tell you about the Samaritans, just in case you don't know. The northern kingdom, it was taken over by the Jews. They were taken over by the Assyrians. They went to a place that became known as Samaria. They turned from God, the Jews, they turned from God. It'd be like our ELC family, people that turned from God, they turned from God, they, they turned from God, they, 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 they put other things before God. And, and then they not only did that that, 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 that was one thing, but they inbred, you know, I, I'll never forget, um, about 10 years ago, we had a, an African-American and a, 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 a white person that came to our church. You know what their number one question for us is, are, are people like us welcome here? It broke my heart that they would even have to ask that question, but I understand because of the world that we live in. He said, you're not gonna be judged here, man. We love you. But the Samaritans, it wasn't just about being racist, but watch this. I want you to hear why the Jews would literally go on the other side rather than deal with a Samaritan. They, they would literally, literally go, if, if they were going somewhere, they would, they would bypass Samaria, not even to go through there. They, they stubbed their nose at them. They, they, they hated them. Here's one of the reasons why. Because when the Jews came back to Jerusalem, they were building the temple and the Samaritans would come and they would pour pig's blood. Pigs were unclean, but it was more than that. They wanted to contaminate the temple. And can I tell you, so oftentimes that's what happens. People want to contaminate the house of God. They want to contaminate the, the people of God. In other words, they've been hurt or whatever. So, so, so they take it out on the house of God. They take it out on the people of God. And they, they, they again, they, they, they start pouring the wrong kind of blood. I want you to know, you're not covered by a pig's blood. You're not covered by a dog's blood. You're covered by the blood of the lamb. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Don't get on the wrong side of blood. Don't get pig blood on you. Don't be Somebody that tries to bring stain and contamination. Let's be lovers, y'all. Come on, family. Let's be lovers of God. And even to people who don't deserve it. Because God is love. And God so loves us. And he says, shouldn't you love everybody like that? Shouldn't you love everybody like that? Embrace. What God says is the most important commandment. Isn't it interesting that God had to make love a commandment? I command you, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Man, why are you being so strong, Jesus? Like, just give me some encouragement. Like, just encourage me, don't command me. No, I'm commanding you because that's what it's gonna take. And remember, when you don't feel it, you're commanded to do it. When you don't feel it, you're commanded to do it because you're my son and you're my daughter. Don't get your feelings before my command. Come on, church. Come on, church. So those of you that may not be familiar with how we roll here at Elevate Life Church, maybe you're new. Just on my first weekend back after my sabbatical, as God began to deal with me about my own heart and about loving people. I just want you to know the house rules. Sometimes we throw them up here 
Here at Elevate Life Church, we do second chances. Here's what I want you to know. How many of you have never made a mistake? Please don't raise your hand because I don't want to be near you. I don't want a lightning bolt to also distract through our roof. But this is a place that if you've made mistakes, you're safe. You know why? Because every one of us stands in the need of a loving Savior. Every one of us needs the mercy of God, that God doesn't give us what we deserve and we need His grace. He gives us more than we deserve. We do grace. We do real. We do mistakes. We do I'm sorry. Come on, y'all. We do loud really well. We do hugs. We do family. And most importantly, I declare and I speak over Elevate Life Church, the family of God and the family in heaven, we do love. Come on, y'all. We do love at Elevate Life Church. We don't do hate. We do love. 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 Would you just stand on your feet? Let's worship a minute. Don't rush out of here. Just take a minute. Come on. Let's get into God's presence. Let's lift up holy hands all across this place. The atmosphere is changing. The Holy Spirit is in the house. Come on, just let the love of God overflow you. For the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, just take a minute and press into God. The evidence is all. Come on, worship Him. He loves you today. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. Come on, the atmosphere is changing. The atmosphere is changing. Let it change your Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The evidence is all around. Come on, sing it, church. That the Spirit of the Lord is here. Sing overflow. take a little bit of courage all the way up into the far balcony listen to me if you're here just be honest you say I got something on me today that doesn't look like love I got stuff that continually I'm having to work through I believe in this atmosphere right now the atmosphere is changing and guess what God's gonna zap you by his spirit with his love and if you're here whether you need forgiveness yourself or you need forgive to forgive somebody whether you just need to get your heart right with God or you need to get your heart right with somebody else. Can I just invite you right this second? Don't wait a second. 
but step out from where you are and come down here and stand. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit of God just to overwhelm you with his love. Just come right now. Some of you are standing next to somebody. There's just some stuff that's been going on. Come on, would you get down here right now? We're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be overwhelmed today. Not with bad things, but we're going to be overwhelmed with the love of God, with the Spirit of God. Come on, let's sing the Spirit of God again. Let's sing it. Come on, come on, come on. tell you that hurts aren't real because they are I'm not going to tell you that I don't hurt myself at times but I'm telling you if there's one thing I want to be obedient in with God more than anything else it's the thing that's more important to him than anything else and that is love that is love and when you know how much God loves you And how you don't deserve his love, none of us do. Nobody deserves your love that's hurt you. Nobody deserves your love that you have some odd against. But I'm telling you, you are a son and a daughter of the Most High God. And God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. But watch this according or in harmony with, in rhythm with the power that works in you. So what kind of power is going to work in Keith Craft? Whatever I decide, and here's what I've decided. I'm going to love and not hate. I'm going to be grateful and not ungrateful. I'm going to give honor, not because people deserve it, but because I'm honorable. Here's what I've decided. I'm not going to walk around angry and bitter. I've had a lot of time to practice this with Pastor Sheila. And if you're married, you know what I'm talking about. I'm just joking. She's had great practice with me, I promise. What power is working in you that's really not working for you? That's what we release today. Because the power of love, the power of God's love, because God is love, I have to love. Because God so loved me, I have to love. And I'm loving God when I choose to release other people. You hear me? I'm loving God when I release other people. Lift up hands all over this place. Even on the internet right now, if you're watching Facebook right now, just, just say, I release that to God. Listen, God can deal with somebody a lot better than you can. You're not the judge. You're not the jury. Two lawyers came to Jesus trying to trick him. Listen, you can't trick God. And you can't trick God's people. 
God's for us. Who can be against us? God's on our side. Whom shall we fear? Come on, church. The Layla Shelley's been watching Frozen lately. I don't know how many times it's been rented, but I've been on, on sabbatical. I don't know what her mother's done. I think she's just put it on automatic rental every day. Let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. She's walking around saying, let it go. Man, if she can learn that at two and a half, can we learn it at 20? Can we learn it at 30? Can we learn it at 40? Can we learn it at 50? It's not too late to let it go. It's not too late. Just let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Would you say that to God? Say, God, I'm letting my way go. I'm letting my stuff go. Anything that doesn't look like love, I'm letting it go. I'm letting it go. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. Come on, we need His presence. We don't need the presence of anger. We don't need the presence of unforgiveness. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. heaven to earth by choosing to love by choosing to let everything that doesn't look like love letting it go spirit of god we're getting into the rhythm of god we're getting into the heavenlies here as in heaven your kingdom come come on your will be done come on church just one last time let's press it spirit-filled church and I'm just going to pray in the spirit for a minute. I want everybody to join me that can pray in the spirit. Don't get freaked out about this. Stuff is falling off of people right now. God's feeling some of you even with this Holy Spirit right now just lift up your hands you say I, I need a baptism in the Holy Spirit I am a soul. 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 I am a so
just say something to you again let me just it's like I'm Josh's dad let me just be your spiritual dad for a minute God's doing a work in me God's doing a work in us get ready get set let's grow God's gonna blow this place apart for his glory I'm so happy to be back with you and all I can tell you is this I'm different God's changing me. He's making me better. I embrace it. I want to be a better husband, a better dad, a better pastor, a better father. I want to grow with you to places we've never grown before. And I just believe in Jesus' name that in this month of new beginnings, that God has started something new at the gates of hell cannot prevail against. I love y'all. I love you. All right. Wow. Well, hey, if you're up here, y'all can be seated. And we're going to clap for you while you're seated so it's not so awkward. What a... It's going to be a good series, I think. Powerful. It's been just such a, such a powerful weekend. And um, just, wow. Uh, I, I have nothing to add to that. Uh, just, um, I'll just, I'll just tell you, um, not just as Josh Craft or Pastor Josh or however you know me, I'm just grateful to be a member of this church and just glad to get to be a part of be a part of just the atmosphere of this weekend. We've just had such a powerful time with God, I think. So just thanks for being here and being a part of that. And um, just know who you are, who you are as a person is, is a strength. It's not just a strength to, to other people in your life. It's a strength to, it's really a strength to God, but it's a strength to the world. Margaret Mead said that um, never underestimate um, what a small group of committed people can do to change the world. They often are the only thing that does. We're not a small group. Hopefully we're committed to love more than we, more than we ever have been. I hope God did something. You know, the great thing about this is that it's, it's not just a weekend where we're listening to a message or some words that have been said. God can speak directly to our hearts right where we're at and things can shift and things can totally change forever. And uh, 
I know, I know for me, I want, I want things to be different. I want things to be better. And so it's just going to be an unbelievable series. I'm just so excited. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. We're getting ready to dismiss, but what we're going to do is we're going to take up our regular tithes and offerings. And I just want to say before we do that, that, um, you know, you heard, if you need an offering envelope, the ushers, that's what they're standing up for. They can get you one. Um, but you heard John chapter 3, verse 16 mentioned today. And I want to encourage you with a thought that I had as Pastor Keith shared this, this particular message. It says that God so loved the world that he gave. He so loved. And when we so love, when we decide to so love, we are generous people. And yes, sometimes that means being generous in an offering, if you decide that you wanna do that. But to give you a practical step, if you're, if you're walking out of here this morning and you're, you're wanting to figure out how you can love better, how you can just be a more loving person, express more love, be a generous person, be like God. When we decide to be generous, we take that step to become like what God's called us to become. And that's what God says. Hey, I love you so much that I'm gonna give to you. He gave us his son to set us free, to let us experience his love in a, in a totally different way. So I wanna encourage you as you go from here, be generous with people. Be generous with what we call it being T-rated, but it really just means be generous with your time, be generous with your talent, be generous with your treasure, just be generous with who you are. Because when you're generous, you, you really do uh, develop this attribute of God that he has. And the great thing about being a part of a, a church for me, the great thing about being a part of a local church is that together we do, we are able to do so much more than we can do individually. When you give, when you sow seed in an offering, we don't just, you don't just support this church. You don't pay to, you don't just pay to keep the lights on. You don't just pay for the staff to have a job. Although all that's nice. It's not what you're given for. What you give is, is there's, there's almost 30 ministries beyond what we do in this community to help people, to reach people to do what God's called us to do as a church. And when I say us, I don't mean the staff. I mean us, those of us that are in this room, those of us that call Elevate Life our home church. You empower us to reach so much more people. There's almost 30, I say almost 30 because there's 29, but almost 30 sounds uh, cooler. It's like saying 1999, you know. <laughs> but there's almost 30 ministries that we support worldwide with, with the generosity that you have. And you might not have the personal capacity to support multiple ministries or multiple whatever but when you sow seed we believe this we believe this is good ground and thank you for for having generosity like that because it's not about maybe for you it is about loving this church and giving here but it's not really about that it's about so loving god first that's what we first fruit for but it's about so loving other people it's about so loving the world that we decide to just be those generous people and thank you for giving I don't want to just teach a message on top of a message, but if you want to love more, be more generous with the people that are in your world. And while we're taking up the offering, check out this video. Born in Australia without arms or legs, 30-year-old Nick Vujicic has become a symbol of triumph against all odds. His inspiring YouTube videos have been watched over 100 million times. It's a lie to think that you're not good enough. It's a lie to think that you're not worth anything. But the road to self-acceptance was excruciating for Nick. For years, he was harassed and tormented at school. When he was 10, Nick attempted suicide. After years of feeling worthless and alone, Nick's awakening came while reading an article about a disabled man who refused to let physical limitations hold him back. In that moment, Nick says he discovered the power to take control of his life, and he has. Today, Nick surfs, he snorkels, he golfs, and plays soccer. He's traveled to 44 countries with his message of hope. Even the worst part of your life can come together for the good. Join us for three nights of inspiration and hope, September 22nd through the 24th. Each night will be full of passion and a unique message from special guest Nick Vujicic, founder of Life Without Wings. Invite a guest and we will see you there. So Nick Vujicic is coming back. And um, if, if you weren't here last year when he, when he did a weekend, it was just unbelievable. You know, the, just the message that God's given Nick, but really how, how God uses Nick to reach people that don't have hope, to reach people that are lost, to reach people that aren't really connected with God. It's just so powerful. And 
since last year, he's just become a really great friend of, of our church, and we're just so glad to have him back. And I want to encourage you to invite someone out. Maybe someone normally wouldn't come to church. Just say, hey, this guy was on Oprah, and uh, everyone loves Oprah, I think. If you don't, um, I don't know. I love her. So, uh, so um, we should love. We love everybody. Um, that's what we just learned. But I just want to encourage you to invite, invite some people out to that. It's, gonna, it's just going to be an unbelievable weekend. And thank you so much for being here this weekend. Thanks for just soaking in what God was doing. It's going to be a powerful series. Don't miss next week. Hey, stand on your feet. I'm going to bless you out. Put your hands up. And while I'm saying this, I'm not just saying it over you. You have the power to say it over yourself because this is what God says about us. So say it over yourself while I say it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May you know that if God is for you, then who can be against you? If God is on your side, then whom shall you fear? May you be like a tree that's planted by rivers of living water, that your leaf will not wither. And whatsoever you do, say it like you mean it. It shall prosper.